Interrupt. You can uh, keep getting settled in and uh, socializing a little bit, but I wanted to give a couple of quick announcements. My name is Dana Schrader. I work in the Office for Sustainability here at UVA. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but this is the first Earth Week event of this year. So happy Earth Week, everybody. <laughs> Um, our office helps coordinate um, every year around this time a series of, uh, this year we've got 25 plus events happening just this week, um, so there's plenty to do if you're not already busy. Um, you can check out our website, it's sustainability.virginia.edu to see the full list of everything. Um, just a couple of other quick announcements. Um, we do have a zero waste event today, which is wonderful. So um, you'll find a compost bin uh, labeled at the back. I think the only thing that isn't compostable is the chip bags, so you can find a, a regular landfill bin uh, for that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to share is, um, since this is part of UVA's Earth Week, we're trying to get a sense for uh, how people are hearing about these events. So I'm going to pass around just like a little survey, if you'd mind telling us uh, whether you heard about this event through Batten Networks or through some other means, um, we'd love to know how to reach uh, more and more people every year. So um, thanks to those of you who have come out. Uh, be sure to get plenty of food, and I think we're ready to get started. Thanks. Hi, I'm Craig Volded, I'm co-director of the Center for Effective Lawmaking, and I'm delighted to welcome Congressman Henry Waxman to the Batten Hour on behalf of the Batten School and the Center. In our 2014 book on effective lawmaking in the U.S. Congress, my co-author Alan Wiseman and I label Congressman Waxman as one of the 20 most effective lawmakers from the past 40 years. In many ways, this is an understatement. The Center for Effective Lawmaking scores each member of the House and each member of the Senate, combining together 15 metrics about the bills they sponsor, how far those bills move through the lawmaking process, uh, and how important those pieces of legislation are. Based on our legislative effectiveness scores, Congressman Waxman is easily in the top handful of lawmakers in the House from the past 50 years, mainly due to his tackling of the thorniest issues before Congress. Among numerous others, in the area of health care, he is responsible for the Orphan Drug Act and for nutrition labeling on products in our grocery store shelves. He also played an instrumental role in advancing the Affordable Care Act. In the area of the environment, he's responsible for protecting and then enhancing the Clean Air Act and for limiting pesticides on the foods that we eat. In his oversight role, he was able to shine a congressional spotlight on major areas of waste, fraud, and abuse, and put the CEOs of the big tobacco companies through some of the most uncomfortable days of their lives, ultimately starting the country down a path towards much reduced tobacco use uh, and a dramatic decline in smoking deaths. Congressman Waxman will be speaking to us today about what it takes to be an effective lawmaker in Congress, how Congress continues to play a significant role in American public policy, and what reforms might make it a more effective institution. He'll also leave time at the end to answer your questions, so please join me in thanking the congressman and in welcoming him to the Batten School. Thank you very much. I, I'm delighted to be here and to talk about what it, what it means to be effective in Congress and the things that I found as ways to get things done. First of all, I uh, always was interested in politics. I used to sit at the table with my father, who was a union member, worked in a grocery store, so he was in the retail clerks union. My parents were very much harmed by the Great Depression, and they revered Franklin Roosevelt uh, and the New Deal and the Democratic Party. So I was indoctrinated very early on. And I followed campaigns and elections and issues. Um, I never thought I would particularly be in public office, but I got active in the, in the Democratic Party and, and in the Young Democrats in California. And I became state chairman of the Young Democrats. The um, chance came for me to run for office when a, a, an a long-time incumbent in the state assembly 
said he wasn't going to run for re-election if he could get through the election that he was in. That would be it. He won, and I assumed he would give it up the next time around, but he didn't. And I didn't know if he was going to try to turn it over to somebody, so my friend said, just run against him. And I did, and won. Uh, so I beat a Democratic incumbent. I'm against beating Democratic incumbents today, however. <laughs> but I beat him in that election and went to the state legislature for six years in Sacramento. There was a redistricting by the court, the state Supreme Court, because the legislature could not agree on a plan that the governor would sign. And lo and behold, the court just drew these arbitrary lines, and there was a congressional district that had encompassed a lot of the area that I already represented. And so I was able to walk right into a congressional seat. Not only was I able to walk into a congressional seat, but the only thing that counted in the state legislative fights and in the congressional fights was to be the Democratic nominee, because the Republicans had no chance. It was so heavily Democratic and pretty liberal Democratic. For those of you who know Los Angeles, the areas that I've represented were uh, Venice, Santa Monica, the Fairfax area, Beverly Hills, uh, some of the San Fernando Valley, and then the last redistricting, I went south and picked up uh, uh, the beach areas, Redonda Beach, Hermosa Beach, all the way down to Palos Verdes Estates. And over the, every 10 years, I was there for a number of redistricting, the district changed, but basically I had a, a pretty easy reelection, which meant I didn't want to run for anything else. I liked being in Congress. I got on the committee that I wanted because I had an interest in health policy and environmental policy, particularly that it affects, where it affects health. And so I, um, and to run for Senate in California, you might as well run for President of the United States. You'd have to raise so much money, you'd have to campaign all the time. And that wasn't what I liked doing. I did it when I had to, but I didn't particularly like it. What I liked was the legislative policy. So I, uh, followed up on a decision I had made when I was first elected to office in California, and that was, I'm going to specialize. You could, all the issues are important. People want to ask you about all the different issues if they hear about it in the news. But if I'm going to really have an impact, I should specialize. And I decided that the issue that was most significant to my constituents was health policy. I had a large seniors population. Everybody is impacted by health decisions, whether it's the government services, Medicare, Medicaid, although we call it Medi-Cal in California, public health, uh, health for the indigents who didn't have insurance, uh, research at the federal level of the National Institutes of Health, uh, all sorts of issues that I thought were really interesting. And if you didn't have government involvement, th there would be a loss. Private industry, for example, makes an enormous amount of money out of pharmaceuticals. But the pharmaceutical companies don't do the basic research that the NIH does. They take advantage of that research and then take the research and develop pharmaceutical products. If we hadn't had Medicare uh, and Medicaid adopted in 1965, millions and millions of people would not have health insurance. The reason for that, by the way, is that most people after World War II got their health insurance through their jobs. It's a quirk of history. Uh, after the war, we were trying to stop inflation, so they said there'll be limits on what you can pay your employees for the employers. But if you provided them health care policies, that wasn't the same thing as wages. Now, one could argue it is, but it was not considered wages, so employers who wanted to keep their best employees or keep all of their employees would say, well, I'm going to provide you health insurance policies. And most people in this country today have their health insurance through uh, their employment. But there was a problem. When you got older and retired and didn't work anymore, 
Suddenly you lost insurance. The employers weren't covering their retirees. So people were going without insurance and the fastest growing group in poverty were seniors. So under President Johnson, they adopted Medicare and threw in Medicaid as well, which was a health care program for the poor, but they designed it for the states to run it. Medicare national policy, national program, Medicaid, a state policy, but federal rules and federal dollars to match the state. And so we were covering the low income, we were covering the seniors, we were covering the working people, but after a while, employers stopped covering their employees in many instances because there was money they didn't want to spend. And there was no requirement to cover their employees. So people had to go out and buy an individual insurance policy. But if they did that, and they had a pre-existing medical condition, they couldn't buy a policy. And if they couldn't afford it, they couldn't afford it. So they couldn't buy it. When we adopted the, Ameri uh, the Affordable Care Act under President Obama, it was focused primarily on those people to buy an individual policy and not to be discriminated against by insurance companies. So that um, even if they had a pre-existing condition, they couldn't be denied the policy at the same price as everybody else. And that's opened up, plus the subsidies for low-income people, uh, insurance coverage for millions more. That, of course, has been under assault uh, by the Republicans who try to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, but they didn't have a replacement. They just wanted to really repeal it. And they didn't know what to do with all the consequences of a lot of uninsured people. And a lot of states didn't take up what we thought was going to be a no-brainer, and that's the option to expand their Medicaid program. Your state seems to be about to do it. It would be a great thing to do in Virginia because there are many people who are unable to buy a, a, a policy uh, and um, they're low income, but most of them are working people. If they weren't working, they usually do qualify for Medicaid. But if they're working and they make a little bit around the poverty line, a little bit below, a little bit above, uh, it, it, the Medicaid, they may not be med eligible for Medicaid. So in the Affordable Care Act, we said, raise the eligibility for low-income people above the poverty line to get into Medicaid. And the scheme was we'd have Medicare for the elderly, Medicaid for the very poor, uh, expanded Medicaid for others, and individual policies that would be available for the people that couldn't get the insurance otherwise. And we're hearing a lot about those issues even today. But I want to talk about my own experiences uh, as a legislator. I uh, decided to focus my attention on and become an expert on health policy. I came to Congress and went on the Energy and Commerce Committee at a time when energy was the big issue on everybody's minds. It still is, but very much so at that time. But I came on that committee because of health. And uh, I went on the Health and Environment Subcommittee, which in those days was like a, an independent committee. It was a subcommittee, but we could hire our own staff and do things uh, and, 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 and uh, adopt legislation. And, we, uh, and I became chairman of that subcommittee fairly soon after when the chairman of the subcommittee left Congress and there was a vacancy. And I uh, challenged the senior member because I thought I would do a better job. I thought I could get the votes. And the senior member to me was a very nice man, very distinguished person. His name was Richard, Richardson Pryor from North Carolina. I liked him a lot, but he had a family fortune in pharmaceuticals and our committee regulated, dealt with the FDA. And he also took a position that cigarette smoking was not harmful which he may not have believed, but he was afraid to say otherwise coming from North Carolina at that time. So I ran against him and won and became a chairman fairly young, er, well, I was young, but also early in my career. And while I was chairman of that subcommittee, we uh, could initiate what legislation we wanted to bring up. We could set the agenda. 
when I set the agenda, I always wanted to set the agenda and have hearings. I always accommodated the Republicans when they wanted witnesses. I thought hearings ought to be fair, they ought to be balanced, they ought to get their say. And then I would try to work out something on a bipartisan basis. Now, you can work things out on a bipartisan basis if you compromise all your principles and just pass a bill that really doesn't do anything. That isn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to get the best policy. So I would say, let's hear the concerns that people have. And often, the concerns that they raised were legitimate, and I would make changes, to, and it made the bill better. Whenever you do things on a bipartisan basis, you usually, usually end up with a better product. So we would try to make a compromises to accommodate those concerns. Sometimes people would raise issues and concerns, and I didn't see how I could accommodate them because I didn't agree with them, but it reaffirmed my belief in the original bill or, and, and the reason why I wanted to move that legislation forward. I always thought uh, that I would try to get a bipartisan bill, and of all the bills that I authored, the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the regulation of pesticides in food, the uh, expansion of Medicaid, to more low-income people, expansion of some of the Medicare program, uh, public health programs like regulation of tobacco, or uh, 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 regulation of pharmaceuticals that Senator Hatch and I worked out to recognize that we wanted to give the incentive for dr drug companies to develop new drugs, but we didn't want them to have a monopoly forever. So when that period of time was up, when the patent was over, and sometimes they had additional time after that, when that ended, we wanted competition right away. So we set out a way in the law to get generic drug approved quickly. Generic drugs, by the way, are the exact same drug as the original. But uh, they couldn't get it approved because they used to have to go to FDA and show the safety and effectiveness of the generic. But it's the same drug that's already on the market. And it seemed foolish to make them go through all the tests and years of work to show that it's the same drug. So we said, let's have an abbreviated process at FDA. They can come to FDA, show they're the same drug, and immediately get approved. And generic drugs have been a saver of trillions and trillions of dollars and made uh, pharmaceuticals far more affordable than otherwise would have been the case. We try to achieve a balance. That balance is all distorted now uh, uh, because uh, there's a bit, there have been manipulations in the pharmaceutical area, but that was our goal. Competition, market forces, lower prices, protector of the, and incentives for the development of new drugs. And we expanded that to people with rare diseases if you had a rare disease, it meant very few people were affected by that disease. So drug companies said, if we develop a drug for people with so, such small numbers, we're not going to make much money. So they'd want to work on a, a Me Too drug that's already a big seller. Well, while they're working on the Me Too drug, they're ignoring these other drugs for people with rare diseases. And they started to be called orphan diseases because nobody cared about them and orphan drugs because the drug companies didn't see a profit. So we adopted the Orphan Drug Act to try to give more incentive to development of those drugs. And that's been a very highly successful piece of legislation with some problems that we're trying to deal with now. But uh, legislation is no final chapter, especially when you have things that can be manipulated later on. And in the pharmaceutical areas, we have the brand name companies, they have their monopolies, they don't want to give it up, they get another patent, they do what they call evergreening, they change the drug in a little way and then they get another long period of time when they can't have competition against them, which means for a long period of time people have to pay the highest prices for drugs. So w w I try to work on issues that I thought were important. Uh, the tobacco issue was a very important issue in, because we held a major hearing with the tobacco executives, all, all of whom, or seven of them, stood, took, raised their hand, and promised to tell the truth, and then lied. Cigarettes are not harmful. Nicotine, uh, 
it's just a byproduct, but it's not, it's not addictive. Manipulate nicotine? No, we wouldn't do that. Market to kids? Of course we wouldn't market to kids. Every statement there was a lie. And then after that testimony, which got a lot of attention, none of you were alive probably then in 1994, but it, uh, it, it drew attention to the issue, and people realized that these businessmen who stood to profit by selling a product that when used as intended killed people and made a lot of money out of it, were just lying to hold on to their uh, ill-gotten gain. And we finally got legislation, but it was from 1994 when we held the, the hearing to 2009 when we finally got the legislation passed. So a couple points about that. Legislation doesn't happen quickly. A lot of times legislation gets passed and people think that, of course, they're not surprised. That's the way it's supposed to be. I don't think too many of you would want to go on an airplane and have people next to you or a couple rows behind you smoking. There's no separate section for tobacco smoke. It fills up the airplane. And people were getting sick. The, the, the crew were getting all the same cancers, heart disease, that smokers were. They were being forced to involuntarily smoke. And we now have uh, no smoking on any of the airlines. It started off as legislation to say for an hour, flight of an hour or less, no smoking. And that passed by one or two votes. The argument was that people would go crazy if they couldn't smoke. It would never work. Well, it worked and it was so successful that I don't think there are any airlines now that allow smoking, at least not the major international uh, airlines. Certainly they're not the United States airlines. So you need patience on getting legislation through. Uh, the Ryan White Act, for example, is our legislation on the books to deal with people with HIV AIDS. As chairman of the health committee and the representative of West Hollywood, where a large number of the early cases of AIDS were happening, I said, Let, let's, just something's going on here. Let's hold a hearing back in the district at the Gay and Lesbian Service Center Let's bring in the people from the Centers for Disease Control. Let's bring in a couple of the doctors who are treating these patients. We didn't even know it was AIDS. We just didn't know a name for it at that point. But we knew that gay men were coming down with a Kaposi sarcoma, which was a very rare cancer, and dying from it. And later we got the AIDS, which is Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, which means they couldn't fight off this particular kind of cancer and, uh, and, and all the problems associated with the lowering of their immune system. We held hearings back in Washington. We brought in people to figure out what's the best approach. I worked with Senator Kennedy. We got a bill to deal with this. We got to the last minute, and Senator Jesse Helms wouldn't allow it to be taken up on the Senate floor. The Senate often requires unanimous consent for it to do things. And he said he wouldn't allow it. And I said, and what, what was his reason? He said, well, if you, if you give them drugs to treat AIDS, that will only c encourage more homosexual actions and sharing of IV drug needles. We don't want to encourage that. We also had an educational program it's an educational program. You're going to tell gay men how to have sex? So he wouldn't allow the bill to come up. I went over to him and I said, I thought that he was doing a real disservice because this is a, an epidemic that was multiplying very rapidly. And he looked at me with a lot of disdain. He said, I think you're doing a disservice. Anyway, we had to come back the next year. And we finally got that law adopted. Um, the point is that you have to concentrate you have to strategize. You have to seek support, both among your colleagues and outside groups, to try to influence the legislative process. And, um, and that it takes a lot of patience. Well, I was successful because I concentrated. 
I developed an expertise so people knew that when I talked about health issues, I, I knew what I was talking about. I had credibility. But I was in the Congress for the long haul. So if I couldn't do it this year, I'll do it the next year. If I couldn't do it in this Congress, I'll do it in the next Congress. A lot of members of Congress could be very effective, but they're worried about re-election. Now, I don't want to say we all ought to be permanently members of Congress. Re-elections are important. But if they had to fight a tough fight every two years to be in the House, their focus of attention was talking to people back home, raising all the money to get reelected. Their success was getting reelected. Well, that was not an issue for me. I was automatically reelected in a safe democratic seat. The other thing is that members of Congress are always looking where to run next. Could they be senator? Getting a lot of attention as a congressman, they could be a senator. They could be a governor. They could go do other jobs. They can go in the, in the cabinet. Well, I wasn't interested in any of that. I just wanted to be a very good member of Congress and get some legislation through. And I thought about it. I had the patience for it. And I always look for creative ways to get things done. For example, when we passed the Orphan Drug Act, it went to the president, then George H. No, it was Bush or Reagan, one of those two presidents. <laughs> they were different. But uh, Senator Hatch was the, my colleague on the other side of the Capitol on these issues at that time. It had been Kennedy, Republicans were in power, then it was Hatch, and Hatch used the bill to attach, attach some other health policy matters dealing with Utah. He wanted a study of the impact of the test for atomic bombs and how it affected people in Utah, Arizona, and Nevada. And I said, that's reasonable. Let's find out what's going on. These people are suffering from different diseases. Let's find, let's do a study. Well, when it got to the president, he was being advised by his budget people, if we find out how it's impacted people's health, we're going to have to pay to cure their health. We're going to have to pay to take care of them. Well, that didn't shock me. It didn't outrage me. But it led President Reagan to the conclusion that he was going to veto the bill. And we were afraid of that. But we had a, a, a television personality who had a strong interest in this. And he did a segment of a show called Quincy. And he was going to do a segment about how the bill was being stopped but all these people needed it who had rare diseases. We had a full page ad from all the different groups, Tourette syndrome, multiple sclerosis, uh, other long list of diseases that were considered orphan diseases. Please, Mr. President, sign the bill. Secretary Schweiker, Republican, uh, wanted our bill. He, he was for it. But he told me he was called on by the president to, to draft his veto message. But I knew that President Reagan spent New Year's Day at the home of the uh, Amundsen's in Palm Springs and they had a circle of friends that got together and one of those friends was a man that I knew I wasn't a friend of his uh, he was obviously a Republican he was active in the Jewish community so I knew him from that and I called him up and he took my call and I said this is an important bill that's sitting on the president's desk and it's not partisan in any way. It's just a way to get cures for people with rare diseases. Could you talk to President Reagan at the New Year's party? Oh, we have a rule. We never talk to Ronnie. We never talk at this is a party. We can't talk. I said, well, I understand that. But if you could just get the word in that this is a bill that's important to so many people, he should take a good, strong look at it. I don't know if he did or not. But right after the New Year's, when we came back into session, uh, the president said he was going to sign the bill and did sign the bill, and it became law. But we had to do all sorts of external campaigns to get uh, the administration at that time to focus on it. One of the big successes of my career was the Clean Air Act. Uh, the Clean Air Act was important to my constituents. LA had the highest levels of air pollution of any place in the country. 
And the Clean Air Act was adopted in 1970. And it had author reauthorization in 77. But when Reagan was elected president, he was contacted by the chairman of the full committee, Congressman John Dingell. John Dingell was a Democratic chairman of the committee, and he, um, and he, he wanted to weaken the Clean Air Act because he represented the auto industry. But he didn't want to go for just an auto industry fix. He brought all the industries together and said, we're going to let you pollute more. We're going to ease up on these environmental restrictions. So he developed a coalition of practically every polluting group in the country. And the Reagan administration was supporting them. It had to move through my subcommittee. I held extensive hearings over and over again to bring out the problems with it. And then when it finally uh, was voted on, I offered amendments to dramatize if we didn't have this provision. For example, this is easy to understand. Sometimes they're esoteric issues, but they want to eliminate deadlines. The Clean Air Act was ba based on setting a standard for protecting people's health and then achieving that standard with a period of time using all sorts of uh, tools, lowering the auto emissions, lowering the stationary sources from factories and plants. And uh, most of it's run by the state, but under strict guidance to achieve the clean air standards within a period of time and to do all the things to keep that reduction going. Well, um, they eliminated deadlines. They eliminated the standards. So with no deadlines and no standards, you can imagine everybody's going to have a good time polluting because who's going to ever stop them from polluting? Maybe a few states, but states have a hard time doing things if the federal government isn't backing them up. For example, in West Virginia, uh, we held hearings on people being poisoned by the chemical plants in Kanawha Valley. There was a big explosion in Bhopal, India. People were dying, large numbers, from exposure to the chemicals. And we found out that the chemicals that were erupted and killed lots of people all at once were slowly being put in the air in West Virginia. We asked the EPA, do you know how much of the pollutants are going into the air? No, they didn't know. They weren't being regulated. Uh, we asked the industry to tell us how much they were polluting. Some gave us answers, but most didn't. But we took the answers that we got from those that reported to us, and it was still a large amount. And then when we put that out, they said, oh, it can't be, it's untrue. It's being made up. Uh, when we said that they gotta do something in West Virginia, even people who were dying at high rates of cancer, living near these, uh, pest, uh, these chemical companies, said, we don't wanna do anything because they could, the industry was saying, you regulate us in West Virginia, we'll just pick up and move to another place. So it was a way to low, lower the, the not, go to the lowest common denominator and not regulate, which was a good illustration of why we needed federal regulations. And we finally got that put into the uh, Clean Air Bill as well. I'm rambling, I'm talking about a lot of different things, but my view to be effective is you use whatever tools you have. When we were in the minority, which I expect never to happen, because I had been in the Congress that had for 40 years a Democratic majority in the House, in 1994 the Republicans won, and they were so full of themselves that they shut the government down. And President Clinton said he wasn't going to give in to them. They wanted restrictions on Medicare and Medicaid. President Clinton said, no, I'm not going to do it. So the government was shut down. People were outraged. They finally opened up the government. And then the Republicans came to me as the minority leader on the committee and said, look, we have nothing to show for our majority and we're in trouble with the public. Help us get some accomplishments so we can run on for re-election. I said, well, I have no interest in helping you succeed in your re-elections. But if you give me a good compromise, if you give me a good bill, I'll work with you and, you, and you'll be able to say you passed good bills. So we got some good bills passed. The Safe Drinking Water Act was reauthorized and made even stronger. The residue of pesticides from food that caused cancer and other diseases 
were more strictly regulated. And we got these through the Congress when the Republicans were in the majority, and I couldn't even do it when the Democrats were in the majority. So you just have to always look for opportunities to advance the things you believe in. I, I, I did an interview, oral interview this morning, and maybe some of you will be able to see it, when I talked about how I worked on certain issues and how you have to be patient. Uh, but I want the chance to have an exchange, questions and answers. You need patience. You need to be in for the long term. Sometimes bills get passed. Sometimes they get passed and people th assume, of course, it was a no-brainer. I had a reporter come to me after we fought over the Clean Air Act for 10 years. We stopped the bad one and then we added protecting against uh, acid rain. And we added other provisions, which we were able to do because President Bush wanted it. And he wanted it, but he didn't care how strong it was. And I knew the strong, as strong a bill as we could possibly get, or as weak a bill as we would get, he'd give the same speech when he signed it. We are protecting the health by signing this into law. Well, we made sure that we made it into a strong bill. His head of the EPA came in and said, we support this because it says the EPA may do this and the EPA may do that. I said, EPA may do it. It also means they may not. So we wrote it. They had to do it. And they could be sued if they didn't do it. So we always looked for avenues to advance what I thought was good public policy to get the compromises, to get the coalition, and to finally uh, get it passed. Today we're living in a difficult time. The Congress is not looking to committees to make decisions. They're not relying on members who have expertise. A lot of the bills that they want passed are handed to the leadership, sometimes by an outside lobbying group, sometimes by the administration. They give it to the committee and say, pass it in 24 hours. The committees don't really know what's in it. They pass it, and then it's changed as it goes to the House floor to see if they can get the votes just to pass it. They don't even know and oftentimes don't even care what the bill does. That isn't the way it used to be, partly because we had parties that were broader umbrellas. We had liberal Republicans and we had conservative Democrats and we had to appeal, appeal to a broader group. Now we've got uh, polarization and centralization which makes it much harder for Congress to do its job. Right now, Congress is dysfunctional, but so is the executive branch. And our government is quite dysfunctional with uh, people watching it with a real sense of unease as to what will happen next. So I share these experiences with you from my own perspective, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about, about today, yesterday, or hopefully what might happen tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yes. No, go, I, I call on you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a few times about, oh, hello. Um, you mentioned a few times uh, running for re-election, maybe fundraising being these these other things that uh, representatives will focus on. Uh, so I'm wondering um, how you see those things might interfere with these, these other objectives that you were talking about. You're saying, you know, you had to specialize and focus. It seems like if a lot of time is, it's like everybody's sort of specialized in this idea of fundraising, trying to get reelected, and then there's all these other issues as well. So like how much time do you think these various representatives spend on trying to get reelected or fundraising versus these specialized things and what maybe what's a remedy? Yeah, fundraising is a very uh, touchy and difficult subject and really distorts people doing their job as, as legislators. Uh, when I, I was elected and I had to raise money, I wanted to raise money. I always raised campaign money because I came from a very affluent district and there were interest groups that always wanted to contribute to me because I was a, an important player in the health and environmental area. And they didn't want to be completely cut off, so they would send in a donation when I had a fundraiser. But I didn't have to work that hard. Now, if, if you're running for re-election in a tough race, members of Congress sit in the, you can't make the calls from your office. 
you have to go someplace, Democratic headquarters or Republican headquarters. You make calls, call after call after call. It, it used to be you talk to somebody. Now you don't even have to talk to anybody. You'd call from a list of people you think might donate to you and usually switched over to an answering machine because otherwise all they would be doing is answering our calls. And they would answer and I, and I talked to an answering machine. Hi, Joe, Henry Waxman, I have a fundraiser coming up. Sure hope you can be there. Uh, I have a race myself, but not much of one. I want to use this money to help other Democrats, which is what I did. And so uh, I didn't spend that much time, but I, now members who have the requirement that they raise more money to stay in office or run for another office spend an enormous amount of time. Uh, and they show up to vote on the House floor, and they don't go back to their committees, they don't go back to their offices as much as they go back to continue making calls. Now, with the Citizens United decision, which has opened up to unlimited donations, uh, we have the problem, it's not even the parties. If the Democratic Party raised money and the Republican Party raised money for the election campaigns, that's understandable, that's always been the case. You look to your party to help you out. Now it's outside groups, in very, very wealthy individuals who can give unlimited dollars. I, I had a tough election only once in the 40 years I was in office. After the last redistricting, and they gave me a lot of new area, and I had a very wealthy guy in the new area jump into the race. We have a law in California where you don't win the Democratic nomination and then run against a Republican who wins the Republican nomination, everybody's on the ballot, and then the top two run against each other. They could be even the same party. So my opponent was a very strong Republican, gave him millions of dollars to Republicans, and he ran as an independent. He wouldn't acknowledge, he, I used to be a Republican, I'm an independent. But then he spent $11 million out of his own pocket to beat me. Well, there's no way I could raise that money. I had the advantage of being better known but he held me to a very uh, narrow margin because of all the money he was able to spend. And then if I were gonna run again after that election, I would have had to go raise money. I would have beat him. He decided not to run, but at that point I said, that's it. I don't, this is a very bad system. It's all out of your control. You can't even raise the money the way other opponents raise money. You have to raise money against all the other people who are trying to intervene in the elections. So the raising money and money in the campaigns is a real distortion. I think we ought to have public funding with severe restrictions on the amount of money that could be spent and try to have an equal, uh, equalizing uh, impact of people saying what they believe in and then letting the voters decide based on that. More on that. Next question. Jerry. Thanks. First of all, I just want to thank, uh, thank you again for being here, Mr. Chairman. It's a real honor for the Batten community to have such an effective legislator with us. Uh, after the compliment, I have a loaded question for you. Um, I've been struggling in my classroom the last few weeks with 240 undergraduates to explain a phenomenon on sentencing reform or on a DACA uh, border security deal or a bump stocks gun show loophole registration deal. And the students have been saying something that I understand John Delaney has a piece in Time Magazine about today, which is what happens when 90% of the voters support X, sentencing reform, an immigration deal, closing the gun show loophole, but nothing happens. And Delaney's tagline on his Time piece is you shouldn't even call it the House of Representatives because it's not representative of what 90% of the people want to do on some of these issues where liberals and conservatives agree there ought to be action, but there's no action. Mm -hmm. And my question, um, having worked in the belly of the beast myself, is how can we create more incentives for collaboration? Not bipartisan mush, as you said, that where the bills water down and meaningless, but genuine collaboration where you've got at least an attempt to address a major issue where the American people are more ready than their legislators uh, for some progress. Well, that's a, an accurate statement. You can take an opinion poll even in the district itself, let alone the broader community or the nation, and there could be strong support for background checks, even with gun owners. They for, they're for it as well. But there are groups that get their way 
because they have one issue they care about, and they try to figure out how to be as effective as possible. The National Rifle Association is one of the most effective groups around, as was the tobacco industry, and maybe still is. And they seem never to lose. Uh, the reason that they prevail is th there's only one issue they're judging on. And if you're not with them on that issue, you run the risk of they, their being able to talk to large numbers of your constituents to vote against you. Because the people who believe, as the NRA does, are fervent. Same as abortion. If you're, not, if you're against abortion, uh, there are a lot of people who would vote against a member who's pro-choice on that issue alone. We have people in this country who vote against their own economic well-being by supporting people who have hurt them uh, on their health care policies, on their jobs, all the things that are important to their well-being economically, because if you're not with them on that one issue. The problem is a lot of our issues, we haven't been able to develop the, the intensity for that one issue to be able to translate to the representatives in, in the electoral campaign. One of the consequences of this year with the young people that are marching and raising the issue of guns after the killing, another killing in the schools, is that young people are starting to feel this is their issue. And they're saying to the representatives, if you're not with us on this, better polish up your resume. Look for another job. So they're they are becoming one issue, at least uh, setting out the fact that they're strongly on this issue in order to have that impact. But it is very frustration, frustrating when you bang your head uh, against um, a group that's so powerful that, that they could stop things from even moving. I know that when we try to do tobacco legislation, uh, there was a, a majority leader who ran the Republican House named Tom DeLay. And Tom DeLay wouldn't even consider legislation on tobacco. Tobacco was their big, one of their biggest campaign fundraisers on the Republican side. A, a, a lot of Republicans wanted regulation of tobacco. They had family members and friends who died of lung cancer and other diseases from smoking. But we couldn't get a bill up. And I went to see Dennis Hastert, who was nominally the speaker, but he took his orders from Tom DeLay. Finally, Tom DeLay was indicted for a criminal matter in Texas. So the tobacco industry sent a plane to fly him there so he could plead not guilty. That's how tight he was with the tobacco industry. And the NRA is very tight with a lot of the Republicans. They will start moving away when they really get the message that not just a majority of the voters in a poll support a different position, but members of their vote, voting constituents are going to vote against them and really make them pay a price, but they don't feel they're going to pay a price yet. Another question. Yes. Okay, good. Well, I, I didn't talk about my failures, but I will raise one big one. I became chairman of the full Energy and Commerce Committee just as President Obama was taking the presidency. And the reason I became chairman is I ran for it, uh, and I said I would be most effective on two of the issues that were in our committee. One was the Affordable Care Act, and the second one was the environment and climate change. I had held hearings on climate change. I'd been active on the issue. It was time to get legislation through. So I challenged John Dingell. He was okay on the issue, but he wasn't. He was in his mid to late 80s at that point. He had been chairman for 30 years, ranking or chairman. 
I didn't think he could do the job that, that needed to be done because you have a limited amount of time with a new president. So I ran for it, I won the chairmanship, and I put out legislation for a cap and trade on carbon emissions that cause climate change. And we worked very, very hard on that legislation. Uh, one of our allies was a, a Virginia member who was very important and constructive. He represented a lot of the coal areas and ended up being forced out and lost his reelection, even though he had been in for many uh, decades. But uh, we got the bill passed through the House. It was very tough. And in the Senate, they couldn't take it up. They couldn't get the 60 votes. You need 60 votes to take up legislation. If it were a simple majority, they would have passed our bill. But they couldn't get it. Uh, senator Kerry was a senator at the time before he became Secretary of State. He tried to redo the bill. I said, just pass anything. Because if you pass something on the same subject, we can go to a conference. And then the conference can report out the bill that has to go to both houses to pass. But at least we we get to the bottom line on the legislation, then we could sell it. But he wanted to redo the whole bill. Then they got hung up on the health bill. And time went by. Timing is very important. Victories are perishable. And that one perished, as did the chance to do anything about climate change. I continued working on that issue. And with the uh, Obama administration, they were set to have Hillary Clinton move that issue forward in a way that they could really get things done, but we lost. So that issue is pushed aside while we now have an administration that believes in more coal to be burned, more pollution, and doesn't believe there are any consequences to the climate. They think it's a hoax. And so we are now seeing record number of uh, pollution uh, for, that caused greenhouse gases. Uh, and it's unfortunate. That was a big legislative failure. Uh, smaller failures, but you don't need to hear about smaller failures. But one of the embarrassing situations, I went to the Middle East uh, with uh, Jim Wright, who was the speaker, and we went to see uh, President Sadat. And President Sadat was an incredible person. He talked in a very flamboyant way. I would do anything for peace. I believe in peace. So I thought it was bullshit. <laughs> he said, I would go to the ends of the earth. And then he said, I even go to Jerusalem. And the press was focused on whether he was actually going to go to Jerusalem. Our delegation went to, down the Nile to look at some of the relics from earlier age in Egypt. Then we came back, and we are set to fly to uh, Tel Aviv from Egypt, and the press asked whether we thought he was going to go to Jerusalem. And I stepped up and I said, no, I don't think so. He just has that flamboyant way of talking. The next day we arrived in Israel and Prime Minister Begin says, said at our meeting, I'm using this meeting to announce that President Sadat is coming here Thursday. <laughs> oh, I was a little embarrassed about that one. Uh, was there another part to your question? Oh, the dirtiest things? Uh, I believe that the dirtiest things that happen, like bribes, is more often likely to happen at a local level. After all, uh, a zoning issue can have a dramatic impact on somebody's income and assets. And therefore, <laughs> They, they sometimes are willing to bribe, and if they find somebody's willing to take a bribe, that happens more often. At the federal level, the, the corruption is more subtle. More money to a campaign, gathering support and constituents. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen outright bribes, but there's a corruption in, of the system as well when people who are very powerful and have money uh, use it as leverage. Uh, not, I pay you this, I give you this, and then you have to give me that. Not, not a quid pro quo, which is the essence of a bribe, but nevertheless a form of corruption. Yeah, Professor. Let me wrap up with a final question, uh, <laughs> okay. which is, uh, we've spoken about how effective you were. When you were looking around through to emulate uh, and mm -hmm. so on, who did you see as effective lawmakers that you wanted to pattern your career after? Yeah. 
There was a congressman from California named Phil Burton. He was from the San Francisco area. He was a unique individual. He was, had an encyclopedic knowledge of every member's district and every political faction in that district and what vulnerabilities there were in that person's election or re-election or what would happen on the redistricting the next time around. Uh, he knew all of those things and uh, organizationally, if I went to the committee on committees, after I left, he'd say, who'd you sit next to? Who sat where? Who talked to whom? And he would get little bits and pieces of information and put it together and figure out what the game of, the, what the game pl of, of play was in getting certain people to win, where it was unpredictable in the early days that the, the steering and policy or a committee on committees would have a lot of horse trading to get people on committees. Uh, he was strong in the substance, strong on the politics. He had a failing that he was a bit obnoxious. And that hurt him, and he ran for majority leader in the House and lost by one vote to Jim Wright. That, had that gone to Phil Burton as we expected it would have, but it was, I thought he had the chance to win it in that runoff, uh, it would have been a very different historical situation that we'd all be talking about in the Congress. Otherwise, I recently went to a former members of Congress event, and they had two members, uh, a Democrat and a Republican, talk about what they're doing and what they did when they were a member of Congress. And one man was a very nice man. He represented a district. He cares a, cared a lot about the problems in this district. When he was a new member, he came to me because he wanted a change in the Clean Air Act to help get something done in his district. And I told him how to do it, and we did it. Because whenever you can do somebody a favor, you want to do it, maybe they'll come around, do you a favor next time around. So he talked about how effective he was because he said, he didn't know I was in the audience. He said, I even went to talk to that great liberal Henry Waxman, and we got this thing done. But then he talked about how he went to schools, even now, to talk about basic civics, how important our government is as a representative government. And he wanted to inspire young people to be active and to be involved. I think that was a very important role that he played. It wasn't a role that I wanted to play, except when I had to back home. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm doing now, I suppose, to some extent. <laughs> but that, that was the thing he prided himself on. Uh, he had a secure district. He won until there was a redistricting, and then he was forced into another district with a Republican that beat him in a primary. But um, different members have different goals of what they want to achieve. Some are more focused on their districts. Uh, 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 and may not even be worried about re-election, but just want to do the right thing to represent their districts. Uh, I felt my district was doing quite well without me. Uh, I wanted to help deal with smog. It was a problem for my district, but elsewhere, I had the motion picture industry. It was helpful whenever I could be to the motion picture industry to make sure they didn't have pirates take their work and cheat them out of their profits. Um, but otherwise, People didn't demand they were, uh, things that, that were specialized. They were for environmental quality. They were for good health care. They were for the things that I was for, and, and I carried on the fights for it. Thank you. Thank you.